Fucking Steve Cleveland. I'm sorry, coach, that you had to uh, withstand and. Uh, <laughs> have you <laughs> ever had a mustache, that by the way? Yeah. I, ha- I actually had a mustache when I played at UC Irvine. As you were rocking a stash right. as we a need player. To find, during this interview, we need to find that photo. Yeah, is there any photo evidence? <laughs> Wait, why have I actually a photo at home? So if you don't believe it, I'll bring it. I'll, I'll, bring, <laughs> yes. it, I'll bring it next yes. week. Yes. And, and, the hair, and the hair is pretty close to the shoulder. <laughs> oh. Wow. We, oh, goodness. We need to see this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've got to see it. this. I'll For bring your it. posterity's sake. And <laughs> yes. some of them are in studio with us today. That needs to be shown to all of the world. All the world. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Cleveland, former BYU head basketball coach, is with us in Studio B, now BYU TV hoops analyst. Hey, it starts tonight against Santa Clara. And our Twitter question today is, what do you expect from BYU basketball and West Coast Conference play this season? You know, I think the expectations of you've talked a little bit about them. One is you need to win out at home. I mean, to have an opportunity. We talk a lot about the NC2A tournament, but today we've talked a little bit about winning a West Coast Conference championship. And I think that's where the mindset needs to be. I think sometimes we talk so much about the tournament that I'm not sure the players believe that that's an important thing. And I believe that the mindset should be, let's win this conference. If we win this conference, then we have an opportunity to go to the NC2A tournament. But I think the expectation for me for this team, in order for them to win out at home and to do the things they want to do, they're going to have to defend. And we've talked a lot about shooting the three ball a little bit better, and we know what Mika can do. But I think it's going to come down to being able to d- defend dribble penetration, to continue rebounding well, and to defend on the road. You may have just answered it, but, I mean, is that is that your biggest concern then heading into WCC play? I, I think – Middle penetration continues to be a problem. I think that BYU's adjusted to the double teams that Mika sees. I think that they understand the difference between pace and being under control in half court. I think they're doing a much better job of that. I mean, they're averaging 85, 86 points a game. They're not having any problems scoring points. What they need to do is get that seven, average of 76 points a game down into the 60s in conference play. Then you give yourself a chance to win on the road. BYU will try and slow down one of the – more impressive scorers and players in college basketball, Jared Brownridge of Santa Clara. And the Cougars have had their struggles against him, uh, most notably in the West Coast Conference Tournament a couple of years ago. Tyler Haas had a big shot to help BYU survive that upset bid by Brownridge and the Broncos. Yet the Cougars have never lost to Santa Clara in WCC play. They open up with the Broncos at home tonight. How do you slow down Jared Brownridge, a team that and, – and Santa Clara team that beat Valpo – at Valpo. And he had 30 against Valpo on the road. I think the key thing is that whoever is going to get that assignment, whoever's going to get that assignment or, or multiple players get that assignment, you switch everything. You don't give them any gaps. They're going to set ball screens for him. When they set ball screens, this is, a, this is what Yoli brings to the table. He can defend any perimeter player. So now one to four, you know, we're a four-man screens for Brown Ridge to come off. And oftentimes we'll trap him, we'll double him, we'll go underneath. Now just have Yoli pick him up. He's six seven, long arms. He's not going to get off any free shots. The other thing is make sure you know where he's at in transition. I mean, that's an important part of it. And so transition defense has not always been a strength of this club. And so I think tonight, throughout the league, and not a lot of teams in this, this league run. There's not a lot of pace in this conference, but there are a lot of shooters. You were talking earlier a little bit about not winning a WCC championship. And yet in the Mountain West, they won four conference championships. Yeah. Let, let me give you an insight to that. The teams in this league, even though the, this league is not as talented as maybe the, the Mountain West was top to bottom when they were in it. Obviously, this is very top heavy with Gonzaga and St. Mary's. But BYU, all the other teams in the WCC are a lot like BYU. They can shoot it. They can pass it. They're skilled teams. Whereas in the, in the Mountain West, very athletic clubs, couldn't, couldn't shoot it, physical. And so when they came up against BYU, they had a distinct advantage. Well, now, it, you know, it's, it's apples to apples here in the WCC. They all can shoot it. They all move the ball. They're very cerebral players, great coaches, <laughs> and outstanding. The WCC has always had outstanding coaches for as long as I followed them. So that's the difference, and uh, I, I like the idea of let's win a West Coast Conference championship. Let's have that be the mindset. You know, I think in the past with all teams, not just BYU, even the teams I coached throughout my life, sometimes you play somebody that's six and seven and you've beaten ten times in a row. What's your mindset? Is it, well, we'll get by. This, this is not that important of a game. They are all important starting tonight.
You mentioned Yoli Childs a second ago, and obviously he's been given a larger role because of the injury to Kyle Davis. We found out Tuesday night that Davis is going to require knee surgery. His season's done. His career at BYU is over. What does the loss of Kyle Davis mean for BYU? Experience. A, a good passer in the post. Somebody that can make free throws. Uh, back to the basket. Got some simple moves. But I think more than anything, just maturity and experience. Yoli has a higher ceiling. Okay, This team has a higher ceiling. I think that you mentioned it earlier about where Gonzaga and where St. Mary's are, and they're very, very good. BYU can still get a lot better, and a lot of it will be on the shoulders of Yoli Childs. Kyle Davis was one of two seniors, the other being L.J. Rose. With so much youth being relied on for Dave Rose and BYU hoops, is it unfair to for fans or whoever to expect this BYU team to compete for a West Coast Conference championship? Do we need to be patient and be like, you know, it would be okay if they don't? Well, I don't, I don't think as a coach you ever want to talk about that. I guess we as Certainly. prognosticators, we can, we can talk about whatever we want to talk about. But I think as a coaching staff, you believe, hey, somebody else steps up. Yoli Childs has stepped up. Who, you know, we, just, we still don't know really what's going on with Elijah Bryant and, and where his health is. And we're missing a pretty good point guard there as well. So Absolutely. there have been some losses to injury in this year. But it gives other people an opportunity to step up. And I think that plus your rotation's tighter. Get used to each other. You know, you're not trying to play 10 guys. Now it's a seven to eight man rotation. I think they're more comfortable. I think Bayo's come in and I think he's earned some minutes where he can come in as a sub. Uh, but, but certainly Aits is going to have to step in and, and others are going to have to step in for Kyle Davis. We've been talking about guys that aren't going to be there. One that we do know that was just added is Corbin Kafusi. Yeah. W what is uh, realistic to expect from him as he makes his way Back from football to hoops. 50 pounds heavier. <laughs> yeah. Is he 50 pounds heavier? 50 pounds heavier. Well, he'll be a wide body, big <laughs> and strong behind the bigs. He, he can guard Pronowski, Pronowski at, at, at Gonzaga, right? Yeah. He, he, he can guard him and get behind him and be strong. I think he brings defense. I think he brings rebounding. I think he, it gives Mika a blow for two or three minutes. Somebody gets in foul trouble. you got a big body that can rebound it and defend it. He's going to get things around the basket. He's going to get breakaways. He's going to get where he relocates and a guard hits him for a dunk. You can't expect any more than that from him. He just needs to play hard. He's, in a, he's got a great attitude, and he's extremely aggressive. And, it, it, you know, it's better that he picks up a couple, a couple of fouls than Mika. But uh, I, think, I think he's really going to help him defensively, to be honest with you. I don't have any expectations for him to score or make baskets. I would hope that if he's at the end of the game that right now he's shooting 100 free throws a game to get that touch back. We have seen marked improvement from BYU shooting from the perimeter. That percentage has climbed from roughly around 30%, not great, up towards that 40 mark. Uh, can you pinpoint why the three-point shooting has gotten better? I think first and foremost is they understand how the inside-out attack works now. I, I think that the first five, six, seven games, they, they were uncomfortable. We're pounding it, we're pounding it. Where do I get my threes? I think they know where they get their threes now and they get him inside out. They get him one more pass. Uh, I, I think very unselfish. LJ's been really unselfish with the ball in transition. We're th th BYU's still looking for transition threes. I think Nick Emery and TJ Haas still have to take that shot if they're open. Now, if Mika is sitting there underneath the basket, one foot from the basket, you got to pound it. But I think they've adjusted to how to score and how to score out of that particular offense, which is so different than anything they've done the last six or seven years. You just mentioned L.J. Rose, and I, I've been impressed with, with him and just kind of the, the calming influence and getting everybody where they need to go. What, what do you think um, his biggest strength will be as we go over the next couple months? This is going to seem strange. I think it'll be in the locker room. I think it'll be in the locker room. I think it'll be before games, after games. I think that maturity. You know, he's, a, he's an east-west point guard. He goes side to side. OK, he gets the ball where it needs to be he distributes. He's really good at finding Mika and the bigs when they relocate and he can hit them. Uh, T.J. Haas is someone that I think we need to continue to talk about as being a point guard in his club. Uh, he has ability to go north south. He can go directly. And he's he, at times he he's looking for the ooh and ah play. He, at times he gets up in the air. Even Nick does the same thing. That's something that has to be eliminated. That's just maturity. But they can't get up in the air and try to make decisions. But I like T.J. Haas' ability to go north south and to draw defenders, hit a, hit a big that's relocating, or hit a wing that's wide open. All right, we move forward again once, uh, once again to the BYU-Santa Clara game tonight, but not before 
we give you our stat of the day. Eye popping. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. BYU's average margin of victory over Santa Clara is at 19.3. They have dominated the Broncos in these matchups. Yeah, that includes a two-point barn burner in the WCC tournament that was referenced earlier, but 19.3 points. So for whatever reason, BYU has played well in each and every contest against Santa Clara in WCC play. That, I mean, that's that's pretty nuts. What do you expect tonight, Coach? Well, you look at 84, 85 points a game for BYU, 68. So you just look at statistics and what they're capable of scoring. Now, Santa Clara is holding people to the, in the low 60s. Herb Sendek is a really good coach. I mean, at ASU, he's outstanding. At NC, I coached against him when he was at NC State. Julius Hodge, who was an outstanding player for him, three times all ACC player. Oh, yeah. We had to guard him. We didn't. We didn't. We weren't great guarding him, and uh, <laughs> it, it was a struggle. But but uh, I know Herb. He prepared. He's 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 a brilliant coach. But at the end of the day, no matter how smart you are, you still have to have talent, and you have to have people that are able to do that. I, the, the only thing, I wouldn't want any of the players, I would never want to have that discussion with my players. Hey, we've won an average of, you know, you hope the players aren't watching this show. Oh, yeah, you know, BYU's beat them by 16 or 18 every time for, uh, by an average over the last 10 games they've defeated them. You know, they have to respect this group. And they have to go in respecting it. And if you, as soon as you don't respect an opponent and you're not prepared, that's when you get upset. Coach, I, I hate to change the tone of this, but while we're on the uh, subject of head coaches, we have just received a bit of breaking news. Uh, the Salt Lake Tribune reporting that legendary BYU Cougars football coach Lavelle Edwards has passed away. <sighs> Lavelle Edwards has passed away at the age of 86 and uh, hard to put into words what he has meant to BYU athletics. And, and again, this is a drastic tone shift uh, of what we were talking about with uh, BYU basketball opening their season today, but it's hard to let that soak in and uh, what he's meant to me personally and, and Jason and, and obviously coach Cleveland who had a, a close relationship with Lavelle. So um, coach, let's, you know, let's, let's put it back to you. Oh, you know what? I, uh, in 1997, wow, <laughs> that caught me off guard. Yeah, well, I think it caught all of yeah. us And I know he's been struggling. Yeah. In fact, the interesting thing is uh, I was uh, I had talked to Brian Santiago last night and he said that he was struggling a little bit. And I said, I need to try to find a way to get myself over there today. And I'd been gone for about 10 days. Uh, I can't tell you what a mentor he was. I mean, he didn't have any real knowledge of, of basketball, but he understood coaching. And I remember one of the first weeks that I was here that I had an opportunity to sit down. I can remember Dave Rose and I sitting in a, one of the spring uh, uh, events where we honor all of the great teams and coaches. And they had just won the Cotton Bowl. Uh, I think uh, they had uh, uh, coach got up there and I looked at Dave and I, and I said, will, will we ever get to the point where we could be honored in one of these spring things? You know, and I, that, that afternoon I went and talked to Lavelle. And I can't tell you how positive it was. When we got here, things were a little bit difficult and challenging. Everything was kind of upside down. And uh, just the insights that he shared with me and, and how important it was to embrace this community, to embrace these young men no matter what they had gone through. And so I, I have some really tender feelings and thoughts right now about what a mentor he was to me. And, uh, and even though... Uh, we didn't spend a great deal of time together. When we did, it was always special. And I love playing golf with him. That was always <laughs> fun. <laughs> the, the, the thing that always stands out, and obviously his, his coaching and his win-loss record speak for themselves, but more than that, for a lot of people and a generation of people, when they think of BYU, they think of Lavelle Edwards. What a great ambassador, whether – it was as a coach, whether it was in the community, whether it was when he was on his mission in New York. What a great ambassador for everything that's good about BYU. Well, and he understood the importance of being kind to people. 
I think his players have great love for him. And I don't think it's an X and O thing. I think it's that, that they felt like he was a father figure to them. He wasn't one to judge. He, he would have, there was accountability. There was always accountability. But at the end of the day, he was somebody that loved people, that embraced them, that he, he was in a position to maybe in some situations we see people where they've had a lot of success, they don't, they don't treat other people as kindly as they should. He always treated everyone, fans, players, fellow coaches. He was respected and loved because he had so much love for others. A father figure in uh, every sense of the word. Lavelle Edwards passes away at the age of 86. Salt Lake Tribune reporting that news. Uh, certainly we are, are saddened and just kind of takes your breath away uh, that it happens that fast. Uh, Coach, I'm glad that we had you here with us um, to help break that news. Yeah. Um, well, we, we love him and his family, and, uh, hey, they're going to need to have this funeral in the Marriott Center. Man. <laughs> because I'll tell you what, the, a stake center is not going to get it done. They're going to have to have it because there's going to be a lot of people want to go and celebrate his life and be a part of that with him. This will be an absolute celebration. Yes, of his, absolute of celebration. His life. Yep. Coach, thank you so you much. Bet. Thank